purpose of this presentation is to kind of give you a background on the process that we use to uh, make trades in our portfolio. Uh, and from this point on, from this semester on, we're going to be uh, keeping track of our trades. In the past, we've just sort of ad hoc put together a couple of uh, uh, presentations or analysis for Professor Sweet, and uh, then we would make the trade from there. But all that information would be lost, um, or if, if there wasn't a junior analyst there, they would definitely would be lost. So the purpose of this diary is to kind of keep track and uh, make some progress. Off. So. This is the Real Estate Investment Trust, uh, so what the Real Estate Investment Trusts are is just a certain designation for a corporation that uh, invests in real estate. Uh, there's some stipulations, but if they make those stipulations, then they get the, the tax-free status from the IRS. So not taxed at the corporate level, only at the, uh, the dividend, uh, the, their shareholders get taxed. So uh, there's a lot more uh, details, but I won't get too far into that. That's just the essence of what a Real Estate Investment Trust is. So as far as the, the Investment Society screen, um, I could get further into detail with this, but uh, we, we essentially just screen for credit, um, credit scores, make sure they're investment grade, uh, growth metrics, um, and a couple other things, a couple other characteristics. And then what we're left with is about 150 uh, companies to choose from, which are broken into sectors. And so this is the Real Estate Investment Trust sector, uh, the results for the Real Estate Investment Trust sector. So as you can see, we own a public storage and it made it through the screen, so we're going to continue to own it. Before we owned HCP, which is a healthcare property uh, REIT, and it did not make it through the screen, so we had to make a, a trade at that point. So from the replacement options, which was the other companies that made it through the screen, we have these to choose from, which is Camden Property Trust, Essex Property Trust, Mid-America, Tanger, and PS Business Parks. Uh, as you can see on the right, we have them broken down by, uh, uh, I guess, property type. So there's multifamily, which is very strong. Three of them came through. We also have retail and office flex. So we wanted to look at the industry level first to see which ones we're going to kind of uh, delve into. So um, from there, uh, looking at the industry by uh, at itself, and this is kind of real estate uh, terminology, but a cap rate is an indication of property values. This is not the income that comes from it, it's the, the actual price of the buildings. Uh, it's based off the income. But the lower the cap rate, the higher the uh, property value. So as you can see here, uh, retail and multifamily offer the lowest cap rate, which is good, uh, and they offer more stable uh, cap rates. So that office flex base, we might, you know, might consider not, not having that. Um, so going further in, into that office flex base, we already somewhat own PS Business Parks. So PS Business Parks is one of the, if you look back, this is the one on the bottom. Um, public Storage actually owns 26% of PS Business Parks. So that somewhat made our job a little bit easier since we already had exposure to this company. Uh, so moving on, we have to decide between multifamily and retail. Uh, so we looked at multifamily and we somewhat decided that multifamily has been saturated uh, based on what we've done, what we've looked at, and also some input from uh, a couple, or my professor at least. Um, so here we have the vacancy rate uh, for multifamily. As you can see, it has trended down since the, uh, uh, the recession, which would be 2007, 2008, people are renting. Uh, but at that last portion, you can see a, a slight uptick. So that, that's uh, possibly indicative of vacancies increasing. So that's bad for multifamily. So multifamilies are like uh, apartments, apartments, basically. apartment complex, condos, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, just kind of explain that. Uh, and then in this next chart to the right, you see the completions. This is construction completions and net absorption. So net absorptions is people leaving and uh, coming in. So the absorption net is what we are looking at. And this is a, a somewhat of a forecast that I pulled from the real estate investment uh, uh, database. And as you can see that. In 2013 and in 2014, net absorptions are uh, should trend below the completion, so it, it's another uh, uh, factor that we would consider as being oversaturated. Um, down here we have the effective rent and the percentage change. Um, as we see during the recession, it's, it's gone down, but it's uh, held pretty stable at about 4%. Um, and then as far as the inventory, this is the total buildings that are out there. And, and there's, they're gradually increasing, and for their forecast 2014, there's supposed to be uh, a surplus of some sort. Um, so from that, we kind of concluded that multifamily is being saturated, uh, just preliminary analysis. 
Um, here's another uh, indicator, uh, unemployment rates for 20 to 24 year olds. This is people who are likely to be renters. It's not the only demographic, but um, this trend, it is trending towards better, you know, unemployment is going down, but it's still higher than the average and even higher than one standard deviation above the average. So uh, these folks, the millennial generation, if they don't have a job, are they going to get, are they going to be able to rent? Um, what do you all think? Probably not. They'd probably stay home with their folks, maybe. Um, all right. So uh, and this kind of takes us on to uh, just looking at unemployment overall. So we know that unemployment's going down. So what does that mean for each property type? So for retail, unemployment's going down. Is that good or bad? Good. For office space, unemployment going down. Is that good for office space? Yes. What about for multifamily? People are getting more jobs. Are they more likely to rent or are they more likely to purchase a home? All right, so it's somewhat negative for multifamily. So this is just our, our little bit of an industrial or industry look, outlook from a macro perspective as far as multifamily is concerned. Uh, so now we want to move into, uh, yes? Before we get off that, is there a, uh, do you ever chart the correlation between the unemployment rate and the multifamily and the retail or like office space? to see which one's more correlated? That would be uh, more in-depth analysis that we should definitely consider doing. I'm curious. But yeah, we haven't done that. No, we haven't. No, yeah. And so uh, just to give you a brief overview of kind of like our process, we meet with Professor Sweet once a week um, and, and for a short period of time. So it's not like we have, uh, if we were doing a security analysis project or getting further into it, um, we're just ba basically scratching the surface and making recommendations off of that. But that's definitely something that needs to be done will be done in the future. Yes, absolutely. All right, so uh, this is kind of, uh, we're, we're going to be talking about retail from here at this point on. And Josh, I mean, perfect time. We didn't talk to Josh at all about it. But retail is looking strong, as uh, Josh kind of mentioned. Um, this is personal income versus outlays. Uh, as you can see, there's there's typically been a slightly uh, small margin uh, compared to, the, to recently since after the recession. And so it kind of looks like there's a trend of saving. So people are. Uh, expanding on, on the last portion. Uh, so if people are, have more money that they're saving, they're making more income as Josh was uh, uh, talking about, it's good for retail, it's a good sign for retail at least. Uh, they've also uh, have a little bit of savings to maybe dip into the savings as well. Um, and this is a, a total consumer credit which is short term and intermediary. So this doesn't include uh, long term like 30 year mortgages, it's just uh, uh, car loans and credit cards. So as you can see, um, we're looking at, there was exponential growth up until uh, the bubble, and which is more linear. And this is a risk that we're kind of having our, we have our eye on, basically. Uh, so looking at pre-recession and post-recession, the this is 2003 to 2013. Um, the slope of the, of the growth the three years prior to the recession is lower than the slope of the past three years. So we're saying that consumer credit has been growing faster than pre-bubble. So that, that's a risk that we're looking at, that we're considering. Um, from there, we looked at the, the retail. So we've decided that we want to stick with retail, multifamily we weren't fans of. So we wanted to move into retail. So we did a multivariate regression. I, uh, I'm not sure if we, we presented on how we go about this. Uh, but basically, a multivariate regression is saying that Price being the y, uh, the, the, the variable that's explained by the other variables, uh, is influenced by price to funds from operations, which is our, our valuation metric, volatility, which is our risk metric, and return to common uh, equity, which is another metric that we use. Um, and uh, based on this regression, our uh, price looks cheap. Um, uh, there's some percentages there, but they're kind of construed. The uh, statistics was at uh, 44 R square, so that was somewhat acceptable. Uh, I know a, a higher R square we've been taught, you know, 80, 90 is perfectly acceptable. Uh, but as far as our intensive purposes, we'll, we'll assume that that's correct. And also our uh, slope on volatility is a negative slope, so the higher the volatility, the lower the price. So everything worked out, um, and the, for the results of that is uh, Tanger looks the best out of all of these. Okay, so then um, what we went ahead and did is 
we took a look at the um, the vacancy rate. So that's the percent of properties that are currently not earning income. And as you can see, Tanger uh, Tanger is actually um, has a has the lowest. They're at one percent, whereas the other um, the other options are a little higher. And <clears throat> That there is uh, indicates that there's actually a lot of demand. There's definitely demand for the um, the retail space that they rent out, um, and we've also looked into it, and they actually have a waiting list um, for their property as well. Um, and then what we went ahead and did is we um, took the gross leasable uh, area, and uh, we took that and we did that per or we did uh, funds from operations and income from rent to gross leasable area, so that gives us about a, some idea of how much they charge per square foot of space. And one thing that Tanger has been talking about a lot is that the, they really want to increase their, um, rent, their rent income, so their, how much they charge their, their tenants. And as you can see here, they are very low compared to their um, competitors. And uh, this indicates that they have a lot of room to grow here. Um, as you can see, we've highlighted Simon Property Groups. Uh, Simon Property Group is uh, one of their lead competitors. In the uh, they develop malls and uh, also some um, outlet space as well. Um, but they are uh, plenty, plenty higher than uh, than Tanger is. And. Here we just took a look at the volatility, um, and as you can see, Tanger is uh, below the average on most of the uh, indications here, 10-day, uh, 30-day, uh, short-term and long-term long volatility. Um, so another thing that I, I took a look at was how did, how did they do during the recession, right? So as you can see, the white line, uh, I don't know if you can see that around there, that's uh, Tanger. Uh, Tanger outlets, right? And this time was the uh, the recession time. So this this shows that uh, during that time they were their price was fluctuating a lot less than than the rest of the retail real estate investment trust. Um, this shows a, a level their level of, of leverage. So um, they're ranked number two. Um, they, they have uh, of the lease leverage on, on all these uh, indicators here that you see uh, EBIT to EBITDA, uh, debt to EBITDA, in interest ex or EBITDA to interest expense, and uh, so on and so forth. So then a little bit about uh, Tanger Outlets. They are, what sets them apart is that they're the only uh, publicly traded real estate investment trust that focuses mostly on the outlet space, right? Y'all been to Tanger? San Tanger. San, in San Marcos. In San Marcos. Yeah, Outlet Center. Just give you kind of what we're talking. Yeah, about. That, that's what that's that's the company that we're speaking about here. So they they have 460 different brand names. So they they have lots of different um, tenants. Um, they count 180 million shoppers per uh, per year, and they're they're strategically located um, to target tourists. So they. They place themselves between cities, like San Marcos, right, is between San Antonio and Austin. Um, and there's also some other examples in Clarksburg, which is between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., and <clears throat> among other examples as well. Uh, in addition to that, they build near vacation homes as well, um, and vacation areas in general, uh, like the Hershey is near that Hershey Park in Pennsylvania, and MGM Grand, they, they have a, a, an outlet center near uh, uh, casino uh, and resort, right? Casino resort, yes. Um, so, also, like we, like I mentioned earlier, they they are increasing their rental rates already as it is, and they have a lot of room to grow. They're currently at three point nine dollars per square foot, while the industry average is around nine point six. So they they have a lot of room to grow there. Um, also, the sales for their top tenants are very strong, and we can take a look at some of their numbers here. So. The average tenant from uh, of Tanger Outlets makes uh, it, this is these graphs are comparing them to uh, the this S and P index here is for uh, uh, 
uh, index of retail, of other retail, a lot of retail um, companies. And as you can see here on every measure, um, the average is, is higher here, here, and all up here. <laughs> And so, oh, and this here is a comparison of their, uh, uh, their oh, income per, uh, per square foot and their vacancy rate. So as you can see, they, they charge very little, but they, they, um, they have a lot of demand. So if you, if you compare them to the others, uh, they definitely have a lot of room to grow, like, like, uh, as we've said. So another thing is that we were, uh, that we were looking at is that uh, Tanger looks or Tanger acts as a defensive stock. Uh, they are a discount retailer, so um, they're they're in the outlet space, so they're not um, selling, you know, uh, the they do sell like luxury brands and stuff, but they focus mostly on um, outlets. So you're getting discount prices, and so they you can compare them to something like Dollar General compared to like a Target or something, right? Um, and then they have the lowest volatility of their peers during the recession, um, like we saw in the other graph. Uh, they've had a steady growing dividend since 1992 when they went public. Um, and also they, they, they performed pretty well during the recession. Um, um, and you'll see here that, oh, they, um, they also regained their value a lot faster than the S&P 500. And the FNER is an index of the um, real estate investment trust, and that index has yet to gain its full value. So this is just a graph that shows the um, how how much the uh, the prices drop in the SKT is uh, the red SKT is the Tanger outlets, and the gray is the the index, the retail in, or the real estate investment trust index. And the white is the S and P five hundred. And then, now, uh, this is we just want to look at a recent recent trend. So we did a I mean, we snapshot of the Dupont analysis. So their return on equity has been increasing. So that's uh, due to three uh, components as far as our Dupont analysis is concerned. So that'd be profit margin, asset turnover, or if their equity multiplier. So the equity multiplier is the debt. So if, if their equity multiplier is going up and the rest are going down, then that's a bad sign. But that's not the case with, with uh, Tanger. Their return on equity is mostly due to their profit margins increasing. So this is just a, uh, one thing that we, we considered. And then as far as uh, other recent history, um, this is a couple things that, that we're looking at as far as their business model. Um, in 2011, they started to expand into Canada, so that's going to further diversify their portfolio. And they're doing that with partnerships through Rio Can, which is the largest real estate investment trust in Canada. Um, another thing is they're starting to build partnerships with Simon Property Group, which is also the uh, not not just the largest retail, but just the largest REIT in general. Uh, so that's a strong partnership. And Simon Property Group has been in the past their competitor as far as the outlet space. But now they're being their, their partner, so it's somewhat of a, of a yeah, cooperation part. Uh, so they're, they're opening up a Taker factory outlet um, in Jefferson, uh, and then also in the, the Hershey. Uh, this, is, this is from the Hershey website. It's not from Chris Presser Suite. <laughs> um, right, and then so in recent, uh, uh, 2012, we're looking at 2012, uh, the Foxwoods Resort Casino, that was what we had mentioned, was just MGM. Um, and then uh, in October, they did another thing with Simon Property Group uh, in Texas City, which is pretty close to Galveston, and also in Glendale, uh, uh, Arizona. So uh, they're, they're starting to build their, their relationship with Simon Property Group, which we see as a, as a positive. So I mean, this was our this was our, our a brief kind of overview of the process that we went through uh, amongst these, each other. Um, I'm the I'm the senior analyst, so my role was to kind of guide uh, uh, Ricardo, and Ricardo did most of the uh, company analysis. So from from the uh, perspective of the uh, the macros and the uh, I guess up to the variant regression, that's where I guided him, and then he, he carried it from there on out and to the further and to the further analysis. But this isn't where it stops, of course. Uh, if you've taken security analysis course or if you're planning on or if you just know about uh, analyzing stocks in general, 
Uh, one thing that, that certainly is required is forecasting the financial statements and uh, coming up with a discount rate and you know coming up with a value. But we we're kind of depending more on our screen to make those uh, make the, the overall decision for us. We're just selecting which one. Um, so in the future, we will be coming up with more robust Excel spreadsheets that will uh, that we can update. Um, but as far as this is just uh, as our diary. So I got I'm, I know it's kind of confusing. Like, um, but did, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, go back and give us a very high level view of what a REIT is and what, why a REIT is a REIT and how much that you have for dividends. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so the Real Estate Investment Trust, uh, I'm not sure where I'm going all the time. Um, as I mentioned, there's a couple of requirements that they needed to meet. So the main requirements are 75% of their assets have to be re uh, uh, real estate and 75% of their income has to be from real estate. So that could be either mortgages or equity, which would be owning buildings that earn income uh, through rent. So at least 75% of their income has to be from rent. The other thing is that 90% of their earnings has to be paid out in dividends. Uh, so, I mean, if you consider what that means for a company, their retained earnings have to come from somewhere. Um, and that's where we would uh, kind of go into further uh, explanation of the funds from operations, which is another metric we kind of mentioned earlier. So funds from operations takes out depreciation because of uh, uh, typically buildings do not sell for their salvage value as with typical, uh, say if they bought machinery, if you bought a tractor, you would probably sell it close to the salvage value of the depreciation, whereas if you buy a building, you'd probably sell it for more than you bought it uh, in most most scenarios. Uh, so that's that's just, I guess, somewhat, do you want a little bit more explanation? Sure, no, I was just curious. Yeah, like, so it's 90% 90, 90 of... Their income is paid out as dividends. Yeah. So ten uh, percent can be reinvested. Yes. And then, so they they get uh, the, the corporate tax waived. They should be state federal tax. Yes. And then where they operate, and then the where their tax the income level is only to their shareholders. That's in the form of dividends. Those get taxed. And is it is Simon? Is that also a multinational? Do you know if, they, if there's if there's one of those companies that remember they're really on Brazil. Uh, I mean, Tanger is doing it in Canada, uh, and they, they do expand uh, nationwide, but those are different. There are different REITs uh, globally, and they all have their own requirements. But for the most part, they kind of stick around those same requirements, the, you know, paying out their dividends, or paying out their income and dividends, and being a real estate company and not a company that does other uh, operations. Any other questions? Yeah. You mentioned, uh, the slides mentioned earlier that, um, the, the dividend's been growing since 1992. Do you do you know the exact uh, like amount of the dividend right now? They just paid recently. <clears throat> um, Don't know the, the dollar figure. Uh, but REITs in general stick around, uh, you know, since they pay out 90% in dividends, they have a high dividend yield, so that's what makes them attractive. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's probably between 4 to 5%, uh, which is, you know, fairly stable, which is the industry standard. Um, do you know? Do you know the share price then? Um, yeah, well, let's just let's just look this up. Cause I know I mean change probably changed today. So yeah, everyone's favorite website. I did it wrong. Uh, whether it be real estate investment trust or 
uh, healthcare back there. Um, and each one is, is, is uh, each sector has its own uh, quirks about it. So real estate investment trust is obviously different than the rest. So we're considering building our own model to kind of come up with our, our, our own screen uh, to be more conforming to our uh, sector. Uh, but others do their own their own sort of analysis, and there's there's a lot of things that you can learn from just being there and kind of observing. Uh, but don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Yeah, it's a great learning experience. Like um, you learn a lot from whoever is above you, or even if you take on something yourself, you can work with Professor Sweet, and you guys can um, kind of figure out how to do the analysis and how to do it right for the certain industry and. Um, the learning curve is really steep, but it, it's it's really it's really rewarding. Um, you can go out and talk to people about this. Um, a, somebody says, pitch a stock to me, and then you can say all these terms and do all this analysis that you did in this briefer. And we're not pitching tanger, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's not it's not a Puerto Rican bond or anything. <laughs>